Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here this evening. Um, we just sort of figured out that this is the first in-person Geshki lecture in three years. So it's really, really good to be back together again. Um, and in this beautiful location as well, really have to say thank you to Father Max and, and Ollie for hosting us in this beautiful church. My name is Ann Scott. I'm very lucky to be the head librarian for our wonderful Nantucket Athenaeum. And I just wanna also say thank you, Janet Forrest, who is the head of adult programs for the Nantucket Athenaeum, and she coordinates so many details with enthusiasm and grace under pressure. So thank you, Janet, and thank you, um, Sammy and Andrew, for giving us a hand with the technology. We're so fortunate at the Athenaeum to have a history of good friends who make our resources, our services, and our creative programs available for the year-round community. The Geshki Lecture Series was created in 2005 with the help of a National Endowment for the Humanities Challenge Grant, coupled with a significant donation from the Geshki Foundation. Um, to the Geshki family, thank you so much for your friendship and your generosity. We're also fortunate to have a highly dedicated board who help us connect with speakers like these. And I just want to take a moment to thank our wonderful board chair for so many things. And it was she, Tracy Flannery, who suggested Tracy Edwards for this year's series. So thank you. Tracy Edwards gained international fame in 1990 as the skipper of the first all-female crew to sail around the world in the Whitbread Round the World race. This was in a male-dominated world, and she and her crew were told that they were not skilled enough, not strong enough, and that they would probably die. <laughs> but they would not only survive, they would break the record for a British boat, a record that remains unbeaten to this day. And Tracy Edwards would become the first woman to be awarded the Yachtsman of the Year trophy. She was awarded an MBE, member of the most excellent order of the British Empire. When her memoir, Maiden, was published, it remained number one on the Times bestseller list for 19 weeks. Her story has also been made into an inspiring documentary, also called Maiden. Today, Tracy fundraises for a number of charities that facilitate the education of girls around the world. Please. Help me welcome Tracy Edwards. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to Nantucket, one of my favorite places in the world, sailed in and out of here quite a few times. Uh, and one of the last places I visited uh, before COVID brought the world to an end, a rather lovely time with my daughter and I here while not working and actually having a holiday, which is not something that uh, I do often. So it's so lovely to be back. It's also lovely to be back because tomorrow I'm going to go and have some meetings um, with the uh, people who run the boat basin and the yacht club because Maiden will be visiting here uh, in August or September. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I noticed that she got a bigger round of applause than me. That's <laughs> okay. I think we know where we stand here. That's fine. Um, so I will let Anne know and, and she will let all of you know. And I do hope that you come down and visit us and see the boat and meet our wonderful new crew. Um, so this is actually quite weird. I, mean, I guess it's weird for all of us coming out of this very strange shared experience that we've all had. Um, this is only the third time in two years that I've spoken to a room full of people whilst wearing all my clothes. <laughs> Zoom is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Seriously, you're lucky I'm not in my pyjama bottoms. I've graduated to jeans, so you're very lucky. 
Um, and uh, so I'd like to tell you uh, a little bit uh, about Maiden. Maiden then and Maiden now. So it's really Maiden full circle. Uh, I think it's important to understand how I got into sailing, uh, to understand what happened uh, then and what's happening now with Maiden. So I didn't come into sailing through the normal everyday route. Um, I was expelled from school when I was 15 years old and I had had a troubled a troubled, <laughs> troubled youth. <laughs> so it's a very sanitized version of my teenage years. Um, I was a horrible teenager. Um, I didn't get on with my stepfather. Uh, my mother, uh, God bless her, I don't know actually how she put up with me, but she did. And when I went home to my long-suffering mother with a letter from my equally long-suffering headmaster, which said, if Tracy ever darkens the door of this school again, we will call the police. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't like doing things by halves. Um, my mother looked at me and she went, darling, education, not for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said something that I've remembered for the rest of my life. She said, Every person on this planet is good at at least one thing. I mean, she may have been crossing her fingers behind, my back, uh, behind her back, I really don't know. But that made a, a huge impact on me. And the next thing she did was one of the bravest things I think that I've ever heard of. At the age of 16, she encouraged me to go backpacking to Greece. 16, at the age of 16, I wouldn't let my daughter walk to the corner shop without following her down the road like this. <laughs> So incredibly brave, but she knew I needed to get away from where I was, get away from the people I was mixing with. Um, I, I stole a car, I was arrested, I was put on probation. And I think quite frankly, I was headed somewhere not very good in, in my life. So I backpacked to Greece at the age of 16, ended up working in a bar in Greece at the age of 17. Uh, and a guy came in one night and he said, would you like to be a stewardess on a luxury charter yacht, that, one of those yachts that you see out in the harbour? And I'd seen these beautiful boats, and it didn't occur to me that people like me work on them. So I was like, ah, 17 years old, okay. My daughter hates it when I do that impression of a 17-year-old. But I was actually, okay. No prospects, no exams, no qualifications, nothing. I got onto this boat, and it was like someone had given me a second chance in my life. And within four days, I'd fallen in love with sailing. Maybe not the sailing so much, and, and not even the ocean at that point, although that was to follow. For me, it was the people. I had found my people. These were people that I had spent 17 years of my life looking for, and I, I didn't even know. This was my tribe, and I literally walked into a world that I belonged in, and I, I just fit like a glove. And these people accepted me, they liked me, which is weird, no one in school liked me. Uh, and uh, I just felt, I felt that this was the first day of the rest of my life. Uh, four days later, um, off we went to Rhodes to start a charter, and I basically worked on boats for the next few years of my life. I had amazing mentors. I had incredible skippers. Uh, they were all men, but you know, we don't judge, always. But they were all great mentors. Every single one of them said to me, so why are you a stewardess? Why don't you become a cook? And my, my reaction to everything was, oh, I'm no good at anything, I can't do that. And the skipper said to me, it's more money. I went, how do I learn to be a cook? <laughs> So I moved up a notch, and so every person in my life, how lucky am I, every person in my life took me to the next level. Two very profound things happened to me between uh, getting on my first boat and, and starting Maiden. The first was my second transatlantic. We were a few days out, and the skipper said to me, can you navigate? And I went, <laughs> of course I can't navigate. I was expelled before long division. I mean, no. He said to me, well, don't you think that might be a bit of a problem? I went, well, not really, you're the navigator. He said, what if I fall over the side? <laughs> I went, well, then one of the other people will navigate. He said, what if they can't? I said, well, I'll use the navigation button thingy. And he went, what if, it, what if the batteries go down? I'm like, oh, for goodness sake. He said, why are you being a bystander in your own life? Why aren't you playing the starring role? It's your life. 
My good grief, that's a little bit profound for two days into the Atlantic, but okay. He said, I will teach you to navigate in two days. And he did. And it was like someone had opened the door to magic. Navigation for me was my total passion. I couldn't believe that my maths teacher in school, when I said, why do I need to learn maths? And he went, just because you have to. If he'd have said to me, if you learn maths, you can be a pirate, I'd have been like, <laughs> OK, I'll learn maths. So everything to me about this experience was a revelation. Um, as I, I learned to navigate, he told, he told me to take us to Portugal, you know, at the other side of the Atlantic, and I went, oh, right, but you'll be kind of monitoring. He went, no, no, we're going to end up where you take us. <gasps> OK. So I did manage to get us there, but I've never lost that. In 40 years of sailing, I have never lost the feeling of bringing us into the port and thinking, I did that. I mean, I often, I often go around to the crew going, I did that, I did that. I did that, and they're like, yeah, you're the navigator. We, we hope you do. <laughs> so all of this um, was uh, profound in my life. Uh, and then I did the 85, 86 Whitbread Round the World race. And the 1985, 86 Whitbread Round the World race was, was a place of no women. <laughs> it, was a, it, was, it was the last man shed at the bottom of the garden, literally. Um, I mean, I was allowed to, to sail on a boat, but I was allowed to sail as a cook. Um, there were, out of 260 crew on 26 boats in the 1985-86 Whitbread Round the World race, four of us were girls. Um, I mean, it just wasn't something that was done. So, I mean, I really had to battle to get on the boat. I lied about my cooking skills a lot. Um, I'm a much better navigator than I am a cook. And, um, but I did get on to Atlantic Privateer. And I sailed around the world in the 1985-86 Whitbread Round the World race with 17 men. And people say to me, why did you put an all-female crew together? I mean, seriously. <laughs> the, first thing, the first thing they said to me was, so we, we have this tradition where we all have a bet to see who can go the longest without washing. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Really? OK. But I had, to, I had to front up because I needed to be on this boat, because I needed to learn this stuff. These men on this boat were some of the most experienced and skillful round the world sailors ever amassed on a boat. So all I could do was learn from them. I had to take a lot, a lot, a lot of flack. I cannot tell you what I had to go through. Um, a lot of hazing and being threatened to be thrown over the side, going around Cape Horn, that was interesting. But I got to the end of this nine months and I could not believe how much I'd enjoyed sailing around the world. And it was like this, it was like the world's best kept secret. And there's only four women doing it, why? So we got to the end of the race, and I had my second profound moment in the time from starting sailing to starting maiden. And that was, no man will ever let me navigate on his boat in my lifetime. And I was 21 years old, and that was, no. What? No. No, no, no. But how do I change this? I'm a very small little person, and this is a very big world, and I have no idea how to change this. So I went home to my long-suffering mother, who was overjoyed that I'd lived and survived sailing around the world, obviously. And um, I said, Mum, I want to change the world. And she went, oh, OK. <laughs> right, and, and uh, what, 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 what do you want to change it to? And I said, I want to make it possible for women to sail around the world. I want to make that normal, not, not, um, not difficult, not weird, not um, the exception. So she said, OK, well, I think you're going to have to change your immediate world and then see where the ripples go. So we, we, we talked about it. Um, and I said, well, as no man is going to let me, I'm going to have to start my own project. So that means buying my own boat, putting my own project together, raising the money, putting the crew together, training, understanding how all this works, and, and, and crossing the start line. <laughs> she was like, simple. There you are, see? <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Um, the next person I met in my life was a man called Howard Gibbons, who was actually a yachting uh, journalist at the time. Met him in the pub, where you meet all the best people, obviously. And we were sitting down talking, and he said, are you, are you putting an all-female crew into the race? And he said, I, I, 
I think I can help you. I think I can be your project manager. So he became my project manager. And then we literally, how we planned Maiden was, so how much money do you think we'll need? Um, two million pounds? Does that sound about right? I mean, this was how we put Maiden together. But the thing is, I would never have done Maiden if I hadn't done the 85-86 race on Atlantic Privateer. I didn't realize how much I'd learned as cook. I'd learned to budget. I'd learned how to raise money. I'd, I mean, I'd done media stuff. Um, I learned logistics, organization, um, how a crew works, how a team works, how a racing team works. I, I, I knew all the stuff that I, I didn't know. Uh, so putting Maiden together was um, interesting, I think is the word I'm going to use there. Uh, we were decided to enter the 1989-90 Whitbread Round the World race. Now this, I know I'm a little bit biased, but this is the greatest Whitbread Round the World race that ever happened. Um, <laughs> you'll see that, uh, so there, there's six legs, um, so six legs, five stopovers, uh, from the UK down to Uruguay, and then the best leg the Whitbread has ever had. Can you, am I standing in your way? Can you see? Okay. <laughs> Um, so that's 7,800 miles through the Southern Ocean, the longest leg the Whitbread has ever had. Why? Because we couldn't stop in South Africa because of apartheid and sanctions, quite rightly. So this was a, an incredible leg, um, an absolute gift to around the world sailors. Then a short hop, 4,300 miles from Australia to New Zealand, back uh, into the Southern Ocean around Cape Horn. First stop in America, this race saw the first stop in America in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, and then um, a nip across the uh, uh, North Atlantic home. 33,000 miles, nine months, um, and obviously sailing through the world's most treacherous oceans. Um, we, we could not raise the money <laughs> to do Maiden. We, when we announced Maiden, I thought, naively, that people would sort of go, we don't think women can do that, but give it a go. But no, it was, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. I mean, literally, a man walked up to me in the pub one night who I did not know, walked up to me, stuck his finger in my face and went, you're all going to die. Um, OK. I couldn't imagine what business it was of his. I mean, you know, if I die, I think it's my problem, not yours. I'm not going to call you up about it. So it was. It was a really interesting process because I had expected people to tell me I couldn't do it, but hadn't expected the anger and the vociferousness of the, of, of the, of the complaints and the, I mean, it was quite extraordinary. But of course, what did that do? That made us more determined. I often wondered if someone had said to me, oh, that's a good idea, off you go. I thought that was a bit boring, <laughs> I'll go and do something else. But more of this stuff got flung at us, we were like, OK, we actually do really need to do this. And the thing that makes me laugh as well is I started this as a selfish project so that I could navigate. You know, the boat, the crew, I pick everything, and then I appoint myself navigator. <laughs> that was the only way I could see of doing it. But then it became so much more. It became about, not just about women, it became about anyone who's ever told you can't do something because you don't fit into this box here that we've created for you to fit into and the people that do this thing. So it attracted not just women, it, this attracted, this project attracted people from all over the world to join us. Uh, we couldn't raise the money. We spent three years trying to raise the money um, to, to do the race and we couldn't. Um, it, it, you know, we had letters like, my favorite letter was, the thought of 12 of my wife sailing around the world fills me with horror. Lucky wife, I thought. He sounds like an absolute catch. So, um, and the other, my other favourite was, if you die, it would be really bad PR for my company. <laughs> it wouldn't be great for us either, but there you go. <laughs> so, in the end, um, I thought, some, I've got to change something. This, is not, this configuration's not working. What do I change? So I said, okay, we're going to buy a second-hand boat and I'm going to remortgage my house to pay for the second-hand boat, and then we're going to remortgage the boat to pay for the refit. <laughs> we actually found a bank manager that did that. You couldn't do that today, obviously. And, and this is her. I mean, this is, this is Maiden. Um, when she arrived, I found her in Cape Town, loaded her onto a ship. Uh, some kind captain said, yeah, I'll take your boat back to 
England for you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> so foot, foot maiden on, on the ship. She was called Prestige at the time. Um, got her back to the UK and we had some of the crew at that point. I think there were probably about six of us and we were all standing on the dock in Southampton. I've been telling them about this, <gasps> this FAR 58, this beautiful boat with a pedigree that is going to be amazing. <laughs> so the ship comes in, they're all standing on the dock and Jenny looks up at the ship and she goes, is our boat behind that one? <laughs> Hopefully. I went, no. No, that's it, that's our boat. <laughs> but that's what we could afford, and we were running out of time, so that's what we had to do. I mean, it was a little bit heartbreaking seeing all these new shiny yachts, you know, sort of arriving in Hamble. But, you know, every, I think every disadvantage on Maiden we turned into an advantage because we had to rebuild this boat. We still had no money. We were the first women to work in a shipyard that anyone had ever seen. That was quite entertaining. Literally, jaws used to drop when we arrived for work in the morning. Um, but then we had lots of help from the guys in the yard. Do you need a spare engine? Yes, yes, we'll have an engine. Would you like a second-hand generator? Yep, yep, we'll have that. Spare ropes, old sails? Yes, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll have all of those things. And we got lots of help from them as well, I think, because they thought it was quite funny, but I don't care why they helped us, they did. Um, and the great thing was we learned everything there was to know about this boat. We redesigned and rebuilt this boat with our own hands. We learned everything there was to know. There were crews on this Whitbread who were kind of going into the professional era at this point, moving away from Corinthian into professional. We had crews who turned up the day before some boats left. Now, I, I just couldn't figure that out because, you know, we were taking time to put this team together and rebuild this boat so we knew every inch of her. When, she, when something broke at sea, we knew how to fix it. I don't, have any of you seen the Maiden film? Shame on those of you who haven't. <laughs> so I'd say that. There's a bit in it where Jenny says, you have to fix it. You can't call the repair people. There are no repair people. I absolutely love that line because that says everything you need to know. Putting the crew together was really interesting because I, I kind of assumed that I would just find them or they would find us, but I couldn't find 12 women in the UK who had the sailing standards or skills that we needed. So we realized we had to look abroad. And so we did. So this is the crew and out of 12 of us, there are nine nationalities and again, no, no, all the other boats were, you know, American or Russian or, you know, British. And, and we had this amazing international crew. And again, it was a huge advantage because we had all these different types of sailing styles uh, come to the boat. And we spent all the time training before we did the race. Um, you know, people say to me, you know, is, is sailing a democracy or a dictatorship? Well, it's a democracy and up until you get to the start line because why would I employ 11 of the best women sailors in the world and then tell them what to do? So, you know, you have this great time where you're putting all this stuff together and will you do it like that? Oh, we tried that, would you do that? And then of course you cross the start line, you have to have a dictatorship because when you're going through the Southern Ocean in 50 foot waves and 80 knot winds, the crew do not want you to come up on deck and say, so what do you think we ought to do now? <laughs> she doesn't know. <laughs> so um, this is the amazing crew. And then we finally found sponsorship. So what I should have mentioned maybe previously is the age of 21 before I got onto the 84, 85, 86 Whitbread Around the World race. I had a charter in Martha's Vineyard on a boat called Excalibur. I was the stewardess. And the charterer was King Hussein of Jordan and with his wife, Queen Noor, and they were there to, um, his son, um, who's now King Abdullah, um, had graduated from uh, Washington. And um, so he chartered the boat and we got talking, as you do, you know. I have to say, I didn't know who he was, so it was, it was probably really easy for me to talk to him. He was just some bloke. I didn't realize, you know, he was negotiating the Middle East peace process at the time. There you go. Um, so we chatted and uh, we realized we both have an interest in radios, communication, navigation. We're both passionate about navigation. We stayed in touch over the years. And when I got to the point where we'd got the boat, we'd done the refit, we had the crew, we were months away from the start line. I called him and I said, I, I don't know how to get to the next bit. And I wouldn't ask you if I didn't have to. He went, oh, for goodness sake, 
He said, I cannot believe that no one in the UK will sponsor your boat. He said, Royal Jordanian Airlines will sponsor your boat. And so Royal Jordanian Airlines ended up sponsoring Maiden with the message of equality and peace. And we were the first boat to sail around the world with a message, which was pretty powerful because women in Jordan at that time had the vote, they went to school, they went to university, they had jobs, they were in government. So, it, you know, it was, um, it was quite an extraordinary thing. And this is Maiden when we launched her. Oh. Oh, come on. <laughs> Tough audience. <laughs> the reason she's this iconic colour is because that's the colour of the Royal Jordanian Airlines planes. So that's what we replicated, that beautiful grey. Actually, um, this is not the exact grey because we still didn't have any money, so we had to steal the paint from the naval dockyard in Portsmouth. <laughs> I'm not joking. Um, and uh, so that beautiful colour, um, that beautiful iconic uh, colour work is, um, yeah, Roger Daniel Airlines planes. By the time we crossed the start line of the 1989-90 Whitbread Round the World race on September the 2nd, 1989, we were, I can only describe us as a, a battle-hardened team of warriors. We were the most determined team you have ever seen in your life. Um, you know, some of the crews had just been thrown together, some of them hadn't raced together. We'd done a transatlantic, the, the, the documentary doesn't show our transatlantic because it didn't fit in with building up the narrative, but it did happen and we won it. Uh, we also did the Fastnet, um, which we didn't do very well in, if you've seen the film you'll, you'll know why. Um, but when we crossed the start line, we were absolutely ready. We'd done the training, we had the boats that we needed, we knew what we were doing. And, but even at that point, even at that point, the journalists were taking bets about how far we'd get. Um, <laughs> so um, journalists were betting we'd get to the needles or to the halfway point, but not one single yachting journalist bet that we would get to the end of the first leg. So that's, but then in a way that kind of worked for us because we were the underdogs and let's face it, anything we did at that point was going to be amazing. <laughs> so the first leg was um, a bit of, it was a bit of a weird one. Um, I had just sacked, unfortunately sacked my first mate three weeks before the start. Uh, we didn't get on, totally my fault. I should have dealt with it months before, but I was a leader learning on the job, and that was an absolutely awful thing I had to do to uh, have to say to do to her. Um, but it was a real mishmash the first leg. Um, we didn't do very well. We came third out of our class, and we were absolutely gutted because why do you race around the world to come first? And everyone else that when we got into port, they were like, oh, "You're alive! Oh, you're." you're alive and we're like we're third so we had this really weird party on the dock with a really 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 sad crew and everyone else really you know sort of celebrating it was very strange uh, the time we spent in uh, uruguay was mostly me poured over the weather charts um, again in the documentary all the all the male skippers it, it, i didn't realize this but all the male skippers were saying yeah, the ice is really far north in the Southern Ocean this year. No one's going very far south. And then there's me going, we're going to go really far south in the Southern Ocean this year. <laughs> it's just, OK. Um, but, you know, we were ready to take risks. And, and this was the only, probably the only decision we voted on that I didn't make the, you know, say, I'm going to make this decision as to how, how hard we should push the boat. Um, so our risk assessment of would we hit an iceberg went something like this. What do you think the chances of hitting an iceberg are? I think they're pretty small. I mean, if you're actually looking for an iceberg, would you be able to find one? No, I don't think you would. That was our risk assessment. <laughs> Thank goodness our insurance company didn't hear that conversation. Um, so when we crossed the start line uh, of the second leg, we were absolutely ready. We couldn't have been more ready, prepared, planned, and determined. Um, so as I said, this is a, a very long leg, 7,800 miles. It's nearly seven weeks at sea. Um, the, whip, the, the race doesn't do legs that long anymore, and it's such a shame. Also, they now have a rule that you can't go very far south, which I think, again, is a real shame. Um, health and safety. Ugh. So 
We went the further south of any boat. We went south of the Kerguelen Islands. It was a big risk. Um, there were some icebergs we didn't see on the radar, which made a couple of us go, ooh, OK, yes, that's um, yeah, interesting. Um, you've got minus 30 degrees below freezing at some points in the Southern Ocean. Um, the, ice, the big icebergs are not the problem. The growlers, the small ones, are the problem because they never show up on a radar. They're the size of a small car and they float just below the surface. You can every so often just see the tip of one of them. If you hit one of those, it's going to put a hole in your hull or take your keel off. Um, you suffer from frostbite. Um, of course, foul weather gear and thermal underwear was in its infancy in those days. Um, the, the main thing was just put more layers on. I mean, at one point, we all looked like Michelin men. We were like this. I mean, you couldn't move trying to sail a boat like this. Um, you don't wash. Um, why would you? It's minus 30 degrees below freezing and there's no hot water and no head uh, with a shower. So wet wipes and talcum powder, lots and lots of talcum powder is the order of the day, but you'll smell the same, so it doesn't really matter. Um, you're trying to eat 5,000 calories a day. That's really hard for me. <laughs> we did have a couple of girls in the boat that did that quite easily, but not many. Um, you are literally, so the, the quickest way to lose weight is pain and cold. And you, the weight, it literally, I can't tell you, it melts, it falls off you. Um, I mean, you can actually see the difference in your own body in sort of two or three weeks time, which is just, I mean, it's surreal. Um, so not the greatest conditions, um, but we raced hard, we raced fast, and we, we really thought we could win this leg. After nearly seven weeks, we sailed out of the Southern Ocean and up towards Australia, and no one knew where anyone else was. Now, this is totally illegal. We're all supposed to have our satellite on giving positions for the boats, but we don't want anyone else to know where we are because of tactics. So a lot of sails get just fall over a lot of satellite systems that, um, that get covered up. Of course, we're all doing it. It's so stupid. And you're giving your position on the radio like, Yes, rock and roll sport, this is made, and my position is... <laughs> so when we came out of the Southern Ocean towards the finishing line, we had no idea where we were. We thought, we thought we were first, but we didn't want to dare. Um, and as we were coming out of the Southern Ocean, uh, all the boats came out to meet us, and Howard was one of the boats going, Your vert! And we're going, third? No! He's going, no, you're first. And we just, I mean, of course we could believe it because we thought we could do it, but it was just, I cannot tell you, it's hard to remember 32 years ago. I mean, my daughter says to me, but mummy, women can do anything. I'm like, yes, we know that now. <laughs> but then it was, you know, jaws literally hit the floor. I think the Royal Yacht Squadron actually, I think the foundations actually trembled. You know, pictures on the wall wobbled a bit. Um, I mean, it was absolutely fantastic. We won the Beef Eater Trophy and um, we beat our nearest rival on that leg by 38 hours, which I can't tell you how satisfying that was. <laughs> Um, the next leg is a short hop. It's 4,300 miles from Australia to New Zealand, um, which is about the longest leg that they do on the Whitbread, now the Volvo. Um, and, and so the last leg has been a very heavy, tough, hard, you know, really... Uh. This leg is tactical, and tactics is not my thing, but we have two really, three great tacticians on the boat. And this is when you are literally match racing in the ocean with another boat that you can see. And it, it's, it's surreal. Um, we did have a situation where we took a whole day to overtake another boat because they kept their spinnaker up. So they were like, oh! We pulled out our, glass, our blast reacher and we went past going. <laughs> <laughs> Difference between men and women, we, we tend to be a little bit more cautious, um, but it worked out in the end. So um, when we got to the end of the, uh, oh, let me. That's uh, this is the uh, third leg. Uh, when we got to the third leg, we then had to spend a night in complete darkness with, again, no positions, racing down the coast of New Zealand, not knowing where L'Esprit de Liberté was. And it was absolutely petrifying. We had, there's a, there's a New Zealand radio uh, um, um, commentator called Pete Montgomery. 
And listening to his commentator was like, oh, we don't know where the girls are, and we don't know where our spread of liberty is. They could be anywhere. And we'll listen. The radio is more exciting than what we're actually doing. We're listening to our own positions on this radio. We cross the finishing line at two o'clock in the morning. Again, we don't know where we are, and we've beaten them by an hour. Um, and there were also about 20,000 people who came out to meet us at two o'clock in the morning. New Zealand's great. There are... <laughs> Thank you. There are, there are only more sheep in New Zealand than there are sailors. That's the only thing there are, there are more of. Um, and that was, um, oh, that was absolutely amazing. And uh, of course, we won our second Beef Eater Trophy. And the two ladies behind us are Royal Jordanian Airlines stewardesses who came round with us the whole way, met, at, uh, met us at each of the stopovers. Uh, so unfortunately, the next, the, the uh, rest of the race, oh, good grief, I'm really running over. I'm going to really speed up now. The rest of the race didn't go so well for us. Um, we, heavy boat, had very light airs, and um, unfortunately, we lost our overall first place. And when we finished at this amazing finish in Southampton on the 28th of May, 1990, we had lost first place, but we kept second place, which is... <laughs> which is the best result for a British boat since 1977, and it hasn't been beaten yet. So um, there were 600 boats out in the water to meet us in, which was just, oh, I can't tell you. Um, I cry if I think about it. And 50,000 people standing on the dock chanting Maiden. I mean, it was a day I will never forget for the rest of my life. Except me being born tells me my daughter every, so, every time I say that. My daughter calls... <laughs> of course I remember that, darling. It was the be best day of my life. It's Definitely the best. Um, she calls Maiden my firstborn, so, yeah. Uh, I sold Maiden at the end of the race. Well, I still had no money. Um, I put together the first all female crew uh, to attempt the non-stop round the world race, and then I put this together, which is Maiden 2, which, would you believe, 20 years ago, is the first professional mixed gender racing team. It broke more, I know, and this is why we did Maiden. Maiden wasn't about all female crews. Maiden was about proving that women are as good as men because you get the best men and the best women in a team. It's not rocket science, you have the best team. So this was really successful um, team, six men, six women. Do you know how many people have replicated it in the 20 years since? Unbelievable. That's a conversation for a next day. I can feel my blood pressure going up, so I must, I must calm. In 2014, I found Maiden rotting in the Seychelles. Um, some man had dumped her there. Um, and no woman likes to be dumped in the Seychelles, let me tell you that. <laughs> She'd been there for two years by the time I found her in 2014. It took another two years to raise the money. And the, the marina was saying, literally, we're going to take her out and sink her. She's not worth scrap metal. <gasps> that is my first point you're talking about. Um, all of the original crew came together. We put on a big crowdfunder, and within two months, we raised the money to actually pay off her debts for, to the marina, and that's how we bought her. Um, I had a phone call one night from Princess Haya, King Hussein's daughter, who'd heard that I'd rescued Dad's boat. <laughs> Obviously, I reminded her, this isn't Dad's boat, this is my boat. Um, and she said, what can I do? So I said, well, we need money. And so she paid for the shipping back to the UK. She said, Dad will come down and haunt me if I don't do this. Um, six of the original team um, came out to meet Maiden in. Um, and she came back into exactly the same yard where she'd been all those years ago, 30 years ago, 27 at that point. Um, we did a two-year refit and restoration on her. I mean, she was in an absolutely terrible state, um, even worse than the, la the first time I rescued her. Um, she'd been vandalised, pieces had been ripped off her, the hull was wafer thin in places because of electrolysis. Um, but after a two-year restoration, Maiden again <laughs> looked like this. And this is actually the right paint colour because <laughs> we could just buy it this time. <laughs> So that's her going in the water again, looks absolutely fabulous. Um, so at the same time as she was launched, the film Maiden came out. I would love to tell you that I organised it like that, it, but it, it literally was just a coincidence. Um, there is no other reason for this slide than I'm just showing off.
I might have to remove Alec Baldwin. Um, OK, so <laughs> um, we she was launched by Prince Charles and Camilla. Um, Princess Haya in November 2018 and we'd already decided by then that what we were going to do was raise funds and awareness for girls education. 130 million girls around the world currently don't have an education. The pandemic means that 11 million more will not return to education because they're the least likely to return and of course what we've seen in Afghanistan all those young girls being ripped out of school we've actually started going backwards. Um, with women's rights and girls' education. So we raise funds as we go around. We fund, fund girls' educational and STEM programs all over the world. We also do outreach programs um, in all of the stopovers. Um, the, last, so the, the first world tour was supposed to be a three-year world tour. And then, of course, in March 2020, the universe had other ideas. But by the time that happened, we'd done 22,000 miles. We'd visited uh, 23 destinations in 13 countries. Um, we carry with us what we call the message of hope, which is thousands of young people all over the world writing to each other about how they think we can improve and change the world. And of course, it doesn't matter what culture, what religion, what language, what ethnicity, um, what age they are. Every message pretty much says the same thing. We would like a home, we would like a roof over our head, we would like food to eat, we would like clean drinking water that comes out of a tap. We would like adults to stop killing each other and also would you please destro stop destroying the planet um, that we're going to be living on. It's all the same message. So this gets handed to children around the world in a baton which gets carried on maiden. It's a big ceremony. But what it tells children is they're not alone. We're all connected and the ocean connects us. It's, I absolutely love what we do. Uh, all the children whose messages get put into the baton, they're all up on the website. If you want a blub, then go to the website and have a look. And some of them, I can't tell you, I can't. Um, they get their hands on the spinnaker. That, that spiral is, that's an old picture, that spiral is now huge. So Maiden Spinnaker now has a spiral of thousands of children's hand prints from all over the world. Um, during COVID, we struggled to survive, like, like uh, many of us, um, and we did manage in the end to find an extraordinary sponsor. In July last year, we signed in September last year, DP World. They already have uh, an international girls' educational program, and they fund girls to do leadership programs to get them into logistics and the maritime industry. Uh, and they're also sponsoring Maiden. What that does for us is that means that they pay for the whole tour. They pay our wages, they pay logistics, they pay everything. So when Maiden sails into port and raises money, that all goes into our foundation. Every penny of that goes to girls' education. We're one of the very few charities in the world that can say that the charity does not pay anything other than what it's meant to do. Um, we have Maiden Days uh, on Maiden uh, now in this, in this tour, as I say, we're doing outreach programs. Um, so we don't just uh, fund third world um, developing countries, uh, girls' educational programs. We work with girls everywhere we go. We encourage them to get into STEM, which gives them better job opportunities and job prospects. And also, you see, in developing countries, we're trying to get them into school. In developed countries, the UK and America is the worst for 15-year-old girls dropping out of school. You remember someone else at 15 dropped out of school. This is why I'm absolutely passionate about it, because 15 to 18 makes all the difference for their life choices, their career choices, their job opportunities, and their earning abilities. So that's what we do with Maiden now. As I say, we're in New York at the moment. Well, I'm not in New York, obviously. Maiden is in New York at the moment. Um, we will be coming to Nantucket, um, and I'm, I will let you know when. I'm meeting with some people tomorrow uh, to look at dates. So I'd now like to show you a sh very short video because I have, oh my goodness, I've so run over time. I'm so sorry.
I don't know if we're doing Q and A's. We are. Yes. I, I saw the documentary, which was fantastic, but I had also seen some interviews that I was found on the web. And in one of the interviews, he said that um, when they came out to meet you, they were throwing food at you because you could <laughs> run out of food. Um, that was not the documentary at all. I was a surprised it wasn't the documentary, and how out of food were you? <laughs> there were so many things that weren't in the documentary. They made a five hour documentary and had to get it down to an hour and a half. We keep trying to persuade him to do the director's cut. Um, so on the last leg, we had no food. Um, we, 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 the, there was no wind. I mean, everyone was slow, but we were, we were caught in a really uh, an area of no wind. So we had to open the grab bags, and we sort of went through the grab bags and took all the spare food out of, out of there. The, the final thing we had left was we, we mixed up chocolate cake mix and fried it. Oh. <laughs> I can't tell you, absolutely disgusting, but it was food. So for the last two days, we were literally living on water. Um, and then these, these lovely people came out in Weymouth, you know, came out in the most book with hamburgers. <laughs> and we can smell them, but we're not allowed outside assistance. So we can't take them. We're like, <laughs> they're going, we won't tell anyone, we're like, no, we'd know, we'd know. So, yeah, so we had to sail past and um, they fed us when we got in. The other thing actually I have to say is um, in the film when Bob Fisher says, Maiden is just a tin full of tarts, on the front page of the Guardian newspaper. Unbelievable, no one battered an eyelid. But the next thing they didn't, they didn't, he redeemed himself. So when we sailed into New Zealand in first place, he came out to meet us um, on one of the boats, and his headline was, not just a tin full of tarts, a tin full of smart, fast tarts. <laughs> <laughs> Which we absolutely loved, you know, and people were going, you do know the word tarts is still in that sentence. So we're like, <laughs> baby steps, you know. And when we rescued Maiden, Bob Fisher was there to see her in. He was 87 years old. He just had new hips. And he came down in his Sunday best. And he, he saw Maiden in. And he sat me down. He said, you know, can we do an interview? He said, tell me about girls' education. I said, Bob, you have come a long way. And he said, Tracy, I had a good teacher. <laughs> he just died recently, actually. A great loss to, to yachting journalism. Yeah. Is your mother living? She's not, sadly, no. Um, I really wish she'd lived to see the documentary because that would have tickled her pink. She would have absolutely loved that. Um, but no, she, she didn't quite make it. Um, but she was, you know, people say, do I have a role model or an influence or a hero in my life? She was my absolute total heroine. That's quite a good question. Never been asked that before. You get the prize. <laughs> OK, I would say maybe half. I did the normal yacht clubs, dinghy, sailing, learning lessons. And actually, no, I, no, probably three quarters were sort of normal route into sailing, and maybe a quarter of us weren't. Um, which is quite unusual in the sailing world, because when I joined my first boat, we were all from weird and wonderful backgrounds. Um, the racing world is a lot more kind of, you know, people have come up through the yacht clubs and, and the dinghies, so, yeah. Uh, to Susan's question, when there were different backgrounds, you mentioned that there's many different nationalities. How, how did you know about these women and how did you know one of them as part of your group? Most of it was word of mouth in those days. Of course, there's no internet. Um, I, I have no idea how women found out about Maiden, but they did. You know, news travelled fast. We had nearly 500 applications from all over the world. We had one from Papua New Guinea, which I just thought was, there's a letter from Papua New Guinea, it's like, so cool. But she couldn't sail, she could only row, but uh, so we didn't think that was... <laughs> <laughs> probably not what we're looking for. Um, so, it, yeah, word of mouth that they found us. And then we, I mean, God, we were so lucky to have that two years to, to putting the project together because women would arrive 
And they'd say, you know, I'd, I'd like to try out for Maiden. I say, right, you have to go and get a job. I can't pay you. I can give you a crew house and you help to re have to help rebuild the boat. And the ones that went, oh, maybe not for me, left. And the ones that went, OK, absolutely, were probably the ones that sort of got through the, the process. And we, we formed a nucleus quite quickly. And then the rest sort of came <coughs> as we went along. It was an organic process. <laughs> I have sailing ambitions for other women. Um, I think I've done my bit three times around is quite enough for me. Thank you very much. Um, I also have a back injury, which prevents me now from, from sailing. Um, I have lots of ambitions for women, not just in sailing, uh, because I, I don't think enough has changed. You know, I, I, uh, I want to tear my hair out sometimes because I alternate between being ah, and then seeing young women out there and going, ah. Oh. So, you know, we, we have seven professional um, female sailors on the boat who are so much better than we were, all inspired by Maiden, which is rather lovely. So they're now sailing on Maiden, which is special. And then we have two places which we keep for each leg. We take what we call mile builders. So those are girls that yacht clubs um, put forward to get miles under their belt to sail with her. We have guest skippers of, of legendary status on, on Maiden. I mean, we've got Liz Ward Wardley at the moment, and I'm so intimidated, I cannot tell you. <laughs> She's so cool. Um, so we take those, and, and we still hear from them the same horror stories that we were telling 30 years ago. Still as difficult to get on the big boats with the money. Still the, use the same language. I'll go and make the tea, love. Do you know how to put that rope around that winch, darling? Do you want me to show you? I mean, oh my goodness. <laughs> so, I think we are getting there, but it, you know, and people say to me, what can women do? What do you mean, what can women do? Women are doing, we're out there. We're, we're showing what we can do. We're out there, we're racing, we're doing. We need men to stand alongside us, and especially men on sailing boats, because it's quite tribal, and it's, it, takes a, a brave man to stand up to another man and say, don't talk to her like that. What are you thinking? So we need more of that. It's happening more and more, but not enough. Yes. Um, what do you think is the best way to keep women in high level sailing? Oh, that is such a good question. And I, I'm not sure I know the answer because I think most women are so exhausted by the time they get to their professional sailing level that the thought of then sitting on a governing board or you know, a governing body or a committee or whatever is, I mean, I couldn't do it. I, 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 I got to a part in the sailing world where I just thought, I actually can't be here anymore. Um, I mean, I went through an experience which I was forced into bankruptcy because of an event I put on in Qatar. And a lot of the sailing world were just so happy that I, my downfall. Um, so I, I had to walk away for a while. Um, I've come back into sailing with Maiden, but for me, that's not really sailing. It's for me, it's the girls' education. You know, I think we do have some extraordinary women at the top of our sport. You know, we've got Dawn Riley, Katie Pettibone. Um, but again, how do we keep them? I don't know. But it's how do we keep teenage girls in sailing? Uh, Dawn Riley would tell you we need more female coaches. I think that's quite interesting. I hadn't thought of that. But then a lot of girls fall out of sport anyway, um, all, all sports. Uh, so I, I wish I knew the answer, but I guess we'll, as long as we're all working on it, we'll get there. Does your daughter sail? Oh, no, they call my daughter Mac, you couldn't pay me enough to sail Edwards. <laughs> I took a sailing on when I had the 124-foot catamaran Maiden 2. I thought, wouldn't it be cool? I'll take her out sailing, and then when she's a famous Olympic sailor and she gets her first interview and they say, what was the first boat you sailed on? She'll be able to say, it was a 124-foot catamaran. She was only two years old. She was sick as a dog. I mean, I get seasick, but oh, she out, outdid me. And she's never forgotten it. And I, t I totally messed up. I know, I know. I'm, I did force her to learn to sail because I said, I can't have a daughter that can't sail. Um, you know, and one day you may have a boyfriend who says, would you like to go sailing? And you'll be able to say, yes, darling, of course I can sail. So <laughs> that works. Um, but she now works for me. She runs our shore events. Um, so she's our event manager. She's been persuaded by the crew to do two legs. 
which, yeah, she was like, mm, yeah, OK, I've done two legs. Um, but she likes to fly from stopover to stopover. I think she loves the whole the sailing world, being part of that environment. She loves being part of a team of 17 feisty women. Oh, we have one man on our team as well, one man. Um, very brave man, very brave. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, no, she, she kind of gets the best of both worlds. She doesn't get wet, cold, miserable, and she gets to be with Maiden. So. <laughs> okay? No, right, you. well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.